just ahead of Amazon Prime releasing on the 26th of September 2023 the three-part documentary The Fake Shake exposing some of the truths about Rupert Murdoch's disgraced journalist Mazza Mahmood have a quick listen to him saying that the end justifies the means at the Leveson Inquiry. Incidentally, I'll tell you how he lied at the Leveson Inquiry afterwards. The public interest is the overriding factor. I've purchased uh, child pornography, for example, which clearly is an illegal, illegal act, um, and that led to a conviction. So yes, there are times when we do we cross the line, but... Uh, the overriding factor is the public interest. And I've never been prosecuted so far either for drugs or, or offences relating from work that I've done. No, I, I'm not suggesting that it, it's wrong to do that. What I want to explore with you is, is where do you draw the line? Because uh, this goes straight into the question of uh, when does the end uh, justify the means? W where do you draw the line? Well, certainly an example I've just given you that buying child pornography, clearly the end justifies the means, clearly and exposing drug dealers, if we buy drugs, expose drug dealers, and that's our intention, then clearly it, it, the end justifies the means. Uh, and and uh, does that mean we'd go out to rob a bank to show that banks can be robbed? No, we would not. If you go to this website, press-gang.org, forward slash Mazza hyphen Mahmood, as you can see there, there's a whole bunch of stuff about Mahmood, including, as you'll see when you go through it, Evidence that Mahmood lied at the Leveson Inquiry, claiming that his stories resulted in like around 200 odd uh, criminal convictions, when in truth the number is way, 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 way less than that. He basically lied. He said the end justifies the means, but does it really when you have to break the law? As illustrated at circusofthemind.net. There you will find proof, including details of the statement I've got from one of Mahmood's former colleagues, Steve Grayson, confirming that Steve Grayson witnessed Mahmood drugging somebody's drinks during the course of a sting, something that myself and numerous other Mahmood victims have asserted over the years happened to them, including Talisa Contostavlos uh, made the same claim. You can see details of the various people on circusofthemind.net. Also on circusofthemind.net, you'll see this video where former MP Dr. Evan Harris, one of the founding members of Hacked Off, the media reform uh, campaign helping victims of media abuse, uh, talks about the evidence that exists that Mazama Mood used phone hacking and unlawful information gathering to be able to manipulate his victims. I would also encourage you to go to circusofthemind.net and scroll all the way down. There's videos galore with evidence and there's court documents from my ongoing quest for justice and whatnot, which you'll find very interesting and contain evidence of my mood, splicing tapes, editing things, fabricating evidence, uh, threatening people behind the scenes, being all levels of the supply chain. In other words, him and his team supplying the contraband and the money to be able to buy it up front in advance. Otherwise, these crimes would likely most never have taken place in many of the cases. And I use the term crimes loosely because people were just pawns that were manipulated. There was generally no criminal intent. But if you scroll down, you will find in the comments at the bottom, the one you're looking for mentions Manchester Evening News, Prince Harry's mentioned Daniel Morgan murder inquiry, and how all these things link in to illustrate the long-term dishonesty and illegal actions of the fake sheikh, Mazza Mahmood, including drugging people's drinks, phone hacking, unlawful information gathering, fabricating evidence, editing tapes to make it look like people said things they hadn't, or to look like they hadn't said things they had, and this is the one you want to click on. Manchester Evening News reports on the fake shake. Mazza Mahmood victim, Alex Smith. And look at the first video on there. You may also find it useful to go to my YouTube channel.
Celebrity Hypnotist, click on where it says Playlists down here. And then you will find one called The Rise and Fall of the Fake Shake. And there are videos galore in there with evidence, evidence that Mahmood and his team hacked people's phones illegally, they used unlawful information gathering, that people were threatened and intimidated and manipulated behind the scenes, that complicated social engineering uh, and entrapment techniques were used that are unethical, if not wholly illegal, that people's drinks were drugged without their knowledge to make them more manipulable and influenced into doing things, that uh, Evidence tapes were spliced to make it sound like people had done things or said things that they hadn't done. And vice versa, also to cut out things that would have made them look innocent, to try and make them look more guilty. When, in fact, all supply chain elements of the contraband quite often were, uh, as in my case, suggested to me by one of Mahmood's team. And then Mahmood provided the money up front to make it possible. And... You can see there's tons of videos and in there you will find the one. Manchester Evening News reports on the fake shake Mazza Mahmood victim, Jonathan Royal. Have a look at that one. The reason why that one in particular is of interest is because in there you will get the information on how I very nearly managed to expose Mazza Mahmood in 1998. Unfortunately, little did I know that he was actually using unlawful information gathering, including... Uh, most likely phone hacking, um, to be multiple steps ahead of me. In other words, he knew I was trying to expose his dishonesty. And at the time, all I thought his dishonesty was, was lying and editing and splicing tapes and manipulating things behind the scenes. I didn't know that he was drugging people. I didn't know that phone hacking and lawful information gathering was being used. I didn't know the extent of it that's come out in the past few years and also elements of it over the past 25 years um but the fact is that all took place in 1998 when i nearly managed to expose him however i now know that in 1994 the police and the cps already knew he should not and could not be trusted yes that's right as you can see at circus of the mind.net in my in the documents for my appeal which is ongoing because i'll be going back to the criminal cases review commission uh sometime hopefully next year 2024 once my unlawful information gathering privacy intrusion case against newsgroup newspapers for what mahmoud and his team did um which incidentally is under my birth name, Alex Smith versus Newsgroup Newspapers, which was filed on the 30th of September 2022, all of which is outlined at circusofthemind.net. Um, I will then be going with the new evidence that's come to light, not least of which is that the police and the Crown Prosecution Service communicated with each other in 1994, four years before I tried to expose Mahmoud's dishonesty, and they said to each other that he could no longer and should no longer be considered a witness of truth. And yet, for some reason, they carried on listening to his lies until 2014, when the Talisa trial collapsed. And in 2014, when they had the opportunity to send disclosure packs to victims like myself, which the Crown Prosecution Service did, all they included was a little bit about what happened in the Talisa case. They did not take that opportunity to tell us about 1994 and the fact that they'd already knew then he should not and could not be trusted. They did not come clean about that. They did not tell us about the fact that in 1999, Rodri Giggs' uh, case fell apart because the prosecution decided they could no longer rely on taped evidence of Mahmoud's because basically it had drawn attention that there were inconsistencies with it. And that's because he regularly and routinely edited bits out or didn't record bits. Recordings got lost or apparently stopped recording, which is nonsense. It's just there was stuff that he didn't want to come out or he wanted to say had been said or done when it actually hadn't. It's a massive rabbit hole. Um, some would say potentially of corruption and cover-ups. Uh, we know there's corruption in the police, or at least there has been in the past. Indeed, Mahmood has bragged about having bent police officers in his pocket. And Rebecca Brooks, his one-time boss, has said at the Leveson inquiry that um, they paid police officers before. 
why when in 1994 they said he could never be trusted again as a witness of truth in any legal matter did it continue and one final thought if Mahmood was afforded journalistic legal license or lawful excuse to buy drugs which is illegal for example or to buy counterfeit coins which is illegal because it was in they would argue Mahmood and newsgroup newspapers in the public interest the story was doing why when the judge in my case as illustrated on circus of the mind.net and the video that i've mentioned earlier um accepted the fact that i set out to expose Mahmood's dishonesty and that it was not a normal case why was i not afforded the same journalistic license as i was working in the course of attempting to expose Mahmood and take a story to a different newspaper why 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 indeed some sort of cover-up maybe because they didn't want it to come out that they already knew in 94 he couldn't be trusted and they've been turning a blind eye it's a question worth considering the point is why was he afforded legal privilege or um, lawful excuse apparently uh you know journalistic license for buying counterfeit coins from me but i wasn't afforded um journalistic privilege and incidentally he didn't buy coins from me he bought coins from himself because it was his team who told me where to get them from and he gave me the money up front to be able to go and get them uh, basically i just picked them up and delivered them to him and i knew they'd never get into public circulation uh, i knew they'd have to be given to the police for them to do a story and i'd give the information of where i'd gone to and all this which i did to the police um so I actually figured I would have the same lawful excuse, same journalistic license that Mahmood had in the course of journalism. However, that was not afforded to me. Why was it to him? Why wasn't he charged? He should have been. I mean, after all, he tampered with the evidence. You can see on Circus of the Mind.net, there's a whole confusion about a uh, number of coins. Three at one meeting, a thousand at another makes 1,003, and yet various documents say 996, some say 999. Some coins went missing. Why? Because in that first meeting, the three pound coins I handed over were definitely one million percent genuine because they were from my pocket and I just played along and said they were counterfeit. They obviously discovered they were genuine and had to remove them from the equation because it wouldn't fit their false made up narrative that was untrue. Go to circusofmind.net. Evidence galore of his dishonesty, drugging people, hacking phones, manipulating people behind the scenes. The rabbit hole's very deep and there's questions on why the police and Crown Prosecution Service did not disclose things to me or other victims post-1994.